The authoritarian state shit that came from Lenin, not a fan of. Please actually read about this stuff. Now, now, granted, it seems like this person has actually read about this stuff, aside from a couple of the nitpicks that I have here. Uh, cool, but has he said why they're bad, or even, like, talked about why any of this has anything to do with his Bible? I don't know, we'll see. That's all I want to look at with Marx in particular, but I want to look at how that developed in time, because there are so many other things that came alongside that. Who came next? There are probably other names I could list, but just to, to highlight it quickly. Antonio Gramsci, right? Marx dies. People are like, well, what went wrong? What was, what was wrong about it? What did he miss? And an Italian communist in the 20th century, Antonio Gramsci, reviewed Marx's reasoning, uh, why the workers didn't rise up to revolution. And, and he concluded that the oppressors maintained domination through voluntary consent. Right, vol yeah. Everybody thinks that their that their labor is consensually given. Therefore, they continue to labor. Yeah. Voluntary consent of both classes because of a majority worldview that was found in the oppressor. They didn't really get woke enough because they didn't have enough options. They needed another alternative ideology to be formed because the majority worldview reigned and they imposed their, I guess, worldview, not, not by force or intimidation, but just by conditioning. So Antonio Gramsci called this the hegemony, their rule with their one world view. And so he thought of the counter hegemony, which was give the people a counter worldview, right? Give them another ideology, get them woke to the fact that they are being oppressed and you stimulate communistic revolution, right? Give them another, and I would argue critical race theory, Give them another worldview, an ideology that tells them you are oppressed. You need to rise up and they will instigate it themselves. The counter. What? He didn't have anything to do with critical race theory, though. Why the fuck was that brought up? What? So how is any of this woke? So the, the way that he, the way that he's stringing these things together to say that, like, one thing's woke and one thing's not. He's saying that. Broadly speaking, being woke is just being cognizant of your oppressors, oppressing forces. And so if you're cognizant of your oppressor being white supremacy, you're woke. If you're cognizant of your oppressor being uh, the capitalistic bourgeoisie, then you're woke. Like, that's, that's how he's stringing these together. What I'm waiting for is where he starts saying how this stuff is wrong. Hegemony. So those are Antonio Gramsci's quick additives to Marxist theory. Where you start to get some really close to home stuff is after him in the Frankfurt School uh, and critical theory gets formed. So taking some of those terms with a hegemony and this understanding of one prevailing worldview but getting another ideology to creep up, enter in critical theory, right, where the terms start evolving. This is where Marxist ideology is almost identical today. And this is probably the most famous and radical adaptation of Marxism. So a group of men developed this theory expanding and applying the ideas of conflict theory that Marx had formed and broadened its horizons because they said, okay, great, you need to ideologize or give an ideology and an alternative worldview to those who are oppressed, but you're not getting the categories right. They're, they're greater. Oppression is much more social in its constructs. It's not just employer and employee. It's much more. It includes additional forms of societal oppression. You get them more woke and you're going to see revolution happen even faster. And okay, so yes and no. The idea that revolution is this one singular thing is really fucking short-sighted. And if you keep talking about revolution as this one singular thing, then I'm I'm I, that's going to be my biggest fucking problem here because anybody who takes their view of revolution from Kropotkin, which I personally do, knows that it's a multi-step process and it's it's a long-running thing that takes sometimes generations to happen because revolution is not just hurt, hurt, hurt. we all got our pitchforks together and we stopped the government that's not what fucking revolution is when you look at writers like Kropotkin revolution is long term cultural shifts it is shifts in the cultural zeitgeist it is changing who owns the means of production over time through unionizing it is make, having easier access to food for people who need it. Like, these are all aspects of revolution. It is a long-term thing. Again, I repeat, solving the problem of bread. The problem with... This is where I'm going to go off the deep end for a second. 
The reason wage slavery as a term even functions is because you don't have a choice. It is an ultimatum. You cannot operate without a wage. If the basics, the bare minimum to survive, were taken care of, which we have the capacity to do, then you would have the ability to select a job that you wanted. There are people who want to work in fast food. Hell, I fucking loved my time at McDonald's. I'm not even joking. But there are people who want to work in fast food. There are people who want to go to college. There are people who want to do all these things, but they don't have time to because they're, having, they're too busy working to put food on the table to keep a, a house over their head. But if food, water, shelter are considered human rights, then why are they not things that we have actively provided to us as positive rights to ourselves? If those things are provided in some way, shape, or form, even if it is the basest form, enough to subsist, you give people the options. You remove the problem of wage slavery because nobody, nobody is forced into the conundrum of employment. Sp people have the ability to start their own business doing something that they enjoy so they can earn extra money. Which is incredibly hard to do if you are also having to focus on keeping food on your table in the here and now. People have the ability to focus on things that they enjoy, their hobbies, which they could end up making money off of later if they wanted to. I was doing video production as a hobby, streaming as a hobby for years, and yet now here we are, and I'm able to actually do them as a job, full time. But I could have just kept doing it as a hobby and probably would have enjoyed it a whole lot more in a society where I was not forced to have to take care of all of that on my own. That was a YouTube sub. Yes, Hidden Marty. So again, that's the issue there. The the, It's not that everything should be provided to you for free. People who think that really, really are, 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 are somewhat delusional to me. It is that the, the bare minimums, the things that we need to survive, those things should be taken care of. If they are going to be considered human rights by any human rights tribunal, then maybe we should treat them like other human rights. This includes things like healthcare. So that people can focus on doing the things that they want and be more productive in so doing. And if your argument is that, well, what about the places that would that would fail without all their laborers? Well, if the laborers didn't consent to being there, then the business fails. If they cannot provide a service that people feel compelled to work at outside of needing to have a house over their head, then of what worth is it? Instead of solely economic, you had the social structure of inequalities, including the sexes, ethnic groups, gender identity groups, right? They, they had the same goals identified with this oppression, but you had to get them aware that it wasn't just employee and employer. It's much more rooted in social structures than that. Do you miss the categories entirely? So critical theory just expanded those class groups. Now, critical race theory, right? This is the expansion for today that adds one more fundamental additive to it. Critical race theory is an expansion with greater, just greater emphasis from critical theory. All the same categories used, oppressor, oppressed, applying to a structural level, societally, but this time, those power structures, those oppressors in all those various groups are based upon white privilege and white supremacy. The only reason those societal structures have formed and risen is because of inherent white supremacy, racism, systemic racism through all the structures of a society. And I don't think that's what CRT says. It doesn't say that these things only occurred because of white supremacy. CRT is about identifying where white supremacy or where racism has occurred within a given Never system. Look at Tulip in the eye. And again, yeah, only in the States. Jolty Dark, thank you so much for the follow. And again, we're not arguing against racism, but they are defining racism with brand new variables that really aren't fundamentally racism as we would know it to just be hatred against an ethnic group. We're all against that. But racism is now inherent in every structure we're a part of. That's not what CRT says. It doesn't say that it's inherent. It just says that it can be present. Very different. Yeah, we're getting to the things he's getting wrong. Just by simple outcomes many of the time, right? If there's more white people here, I mean, it's, there's gotta be racism somewhere. 
No, not necessarily. You can have a majority without the majority being oppressors. It just happens to be that in America specifically, we happen to have majority oppressors. Besides that, though, again, it's not that, oh, God, there's got to be racism in here somewhere. No, that's not what the fucking... I'm, I'm getting tired. I'm getting tired. So with this expansion, you have oppressed people, oppressed by oppressive systems and structures, the working class by capitalism and property owner, owners, ethnic minorities by whites and culturally ingrained white supremacy, right? Women oppressed by men in the patriarchy, LGBTQIA++, by Judeo-Christian, I think that's in its entirety, by Judeo-Christian morality and Orthodox Christians, right? It goes so much farther than that. And every one of those oppressors have, has, has gotten there by some fundamental rooting in white supremacy. Every one of them? N no. But also, I wonder if he's going to try to say that the church doesn't oppress LGBTQ people. I wonder if that's a thing he's, he's going to say. Some form of white racism. So along these Marxist conclusions, uh, there were others who added a, a few other layers. Specifically, if you've heard the term intersectionality, you had a Harvard Law student, Kimberly Crenshaw, who, who wrote in her seminal papers about you could actually codify layers of, of racist oppression in a society. She created a, a rubric to how to assess how, how really oppressed someone is in this class system, just by nature of, of who they are. You could actually identify what category they fit into, how oppressed they were based upon this idea of critical race theory. So, okay, so let, let's throw, let's throw what intersectionality basically is. Okay, so there are certain advantages or disadvantages that I may or may not have based on my race, based on my gender, based on my upbringing. So I grew up in a, a poor neighborhood. So geographically, there is a, a layer of disadvantage. Um, I grew up white, so there's a layer of advantage. Um, I grew up male, so there is a layer of advantage. Uh, but I grew up poor, so there's a layer of disadvantage. Um, so let's throw another person out there. Uh, so they grow up in a geographically disenfranchised area as well. There's a layer of, of, of uh, geographic issues. Boom. Uh, they're female. Well, there's a layer of disadvantage there as well, though we are working on that. Uh, they are black. There's a layer of disadvantage there, though that is an, another thing that we are working on in society. Uh, but they were... While they lived in an impoverished area, which would have affected their education... Their parents were not in poverty. They just chose to live there. So despite them having probably, unless they went to a private school, a less than stellar education and living in a less than stellar area, they might have better opportunities later, like college opportunities. So there's a layer of disadvantage that is not present there. Intersectionality is about taking those layers of advantage and disadvantage and trying to come to some conclusion. Now, uh, most everybody here can probably understand one of the problems with that is that it is impossible to quantify these advantages or disadvantages in any particular way that is accurate. But the base idea that... There's different things that make your real-life video game more hard mode, or real-life things that are making your life more easy mode. Yeah, no, that's, that is basically what intersectionality is trying to do. I think, for me, the idea that these layers have merit is important, but the idea that we can come to a, a guaranteed... Uh, amount I, I feel like the amount of oppression thing you'd have to pull out of your ass but I understand intersectionality enough to go no the, the base idea is fine in America if you are geographically in the south that is a layer of disadvantage if you happen to be black but a layer of advantage if you have to be if you happen to be white like that's that's what intersectionality is is trying to do you're taking these things and stacking them up on top of each other to try to figure out uh, what position somebody might have in society. That's not necessarily a good or bad thing. It's just taking data and trying to do something with it. You put a white cisgendered male against a African-American -Ameri lesbian woman. She is by nature of her gender identity, because it's assumed to be oppressed, and her ethnicity an oppressed... It, it's not assumed to be oppressed. We, we literally had a whole women's suffrage movement about this. Like... There's, there's been glass ceiling issues. There's pay gaps. Like, again, it's getting better. We may one day get to the point where all these differences are erased completely. I hope we do. 
but but to say that there are not at least some aspects there that are problematic towards somebody who is cisgendered female no we, inaccurate uh bexy mama thank you very much for the follow group so depending on what category category they fit into is now how oppressed someone was simply by the shade of their skin really we know that certainly doesn't apply to every scenario right because it's not about applying to every scenario it's about a, like okay if i'm playing a game in easy mode uh but it's a platformer and i've never played a platformer it might be harder for me to play that platformer but if i'm playing a game on hard mode but it's a platformer and i've played every sauna game every mario game uh i've played uh, everything down to like fucking bubsy on the snes and even the ps1 game i am like platformer extraordinaire going into hard mode on that platformer probably not going to hurt me at all i can play super mario brothers 2 the japanese version will be called the lost levels over here i can play that with my eyes closed hard mode platformers not a problem for me intersectionality would say that oh yeah no it, it, it is likely harder for you because you are on hard mode but there's an advantage you have elsewhere uh a predisposition to platformers that can help you there. Again, intersectionality does, from what I understand, it does not argue to be an accurate measurement all the time. It is just a, a series of likelihoods. But as anybody who has played a game of Yu-Gi-Oh! or a game of Magic the Gathering can tell you, a series of likelihoods does not necessarily dictate an outcome. And intersectionality is not trying to dictate an outcome. It's not its job. Again, from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section below, but if I engineer my deck to always have a liquid metal coating in my hand in the opening turn, either through use of ancient stirrings or very, very aggressive mulliganing, it doesn't necessarily mean that I will still not find myself in some games liquid metal less. So these brothers and sisters are really the building blocks of what we see just in brief. To give you an idea, some of the terminology so that you can pinpoint it as we go through these classes to identify each doctrine that we know of the Christian faith affected by this very teaching. And again, it's not like this is the terminology that will often be used in evangelical circles that start adopting this new theology, but it's inherent. It's not a theology. To this worldview. Now, I want to provide a brief assessment before we finish off our class this afternoon of why this is wrong. Looking at the motivations oh, about Marxist here. ideology, where we see this in the woke church, because it really is a war on Christian doctrine entering into the church. So I'm not going to be exhaustive here. We're going to go into much more detail as we look at this class in the future. But I just want to offer some brief critiques. Okay. So firstly, Marxism, critical race theory, hegemony, intersectionality, even in what we've covered and just briefly is, what, what is wrong with this? Okay. It is inherently anti-authoritarian. Anti-authoritarian. We give you three points. Yeah, that's, that's good. It's fine to be anti-authoritarian. There's literally nothing wrong with that. This is the first one. Anti-authority in all of its extents. This is championed by Karl Marx. It refuses to acknowledge any institution of authority in the world and actually seeks to put those institutions of authority away, saying inherently they are oppressive to my freedom. Anything that is inherently authoritative, family, the workplace, state, the church, is an oppressive force. And right, so here's the thing with authority. The problem with authoritarianism, the problem with authority is that you cannot avoid it. I should be able to choose whether or not the church has authority in my life. I should be able to choose whether or not uh, my, you know, family members have authority in my life. Where the state is concerned, you can at the very least choose geographically where you are if you have the means to do so. So, again, being anti-authoritarianism is not a bad thing. The problem that you have is that you view God as an authority, and therefore, being anti-authoritarianism is is necessarily against your God. I should also mention that you don't necessarily have to have a government that's author uh, that's authoritarian. You can have anarchistic government where the people are the ones in control of the government itself, as opposed to the government control the people. You may have missed this when I looked back at Karl Marx and my notes. But he's seen religion, in his words, as the opiate of the masses. It yeah, that literally just meant that it made people happy. It stimulated, in a sense, the oppressed people to stay there because, in his mind, it indoctrinated them to love being oppressed. 
It was the one worldview that he said they needed to push aside so that people could get awakened to their oppressive or their, their, their level of oppression. So it just kept the, the oppressed or the oppressor in his place and the oppressed in their position. But he was anti-authority in all of its forms. And I, I would argue this is the disposition of our culture, isn't it? It's everywhere. Every form of authority, even the very fact of what we, we see in church, someone speaking with authority from the word of God is an offense to people. Don't tell me. Every preacher claims to speak with authority, and then every preacher says that every other preacher is wrong. Don't fucking give me this bullshit. Okay, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. With, with, with authority, you should be able to choose what authorities you answer to, and more importantly, that authority should do something to earn its place for you. Your God has committed genocide. Your God has created original sin. Don't believe me, look in Isaiah. Your God will be responsible for an apocalypse, according to you. This is all in your worldview. So from my point of view, please, far be it from me to not see your deity as an authority that I should give a shit about. But continue. Tell me what to do. It removed equality in his thinking. And it's guised in freeing language, friends, but ultimately what's at the root is it's a form of rebellion. It's anti-God. Every one of these authoritative structures in the world, in each sphere of authority that God has given under the supremacy and sovereignty of Christ is meant to be. Remove delegated authorities from God, right? You take them away, you deconstruct all authority, and you ultimately deconstruct the authority of God. It was anti yeah. Authoritarian. Even Romans 13, 1. You don't have to flip there necessarily. I'm going to read that through quick. But let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. It is an oppressive force in the eyes of Marx and others that proves the existence of a powerful God. So, get so you necessarily have to be okay with an authoritarian state because God granted that authority to that state? I, I don't feel like I agree with that. I, I don't rid of authority structures, you get rid of God and culture. Second point, it's anti-truth. Anti-truth. Material is final, right? Man has the final word and he is the final determining factor of his entire existence. This ideology has no truth. It rejects objective reality. As I mentioned, it's postmodern. It's skeptical. Rather, it is even suspicious of any form of reason, right? Therefore, you lose any objective morality. What is right to one person is wrong to another and what is right to them is wrong to the other one. No one has one basis for morality and sin runs rampant and corrupt. So no objective truth. Again, sin is literally just things that offend God. God is the biggest SJW snowflake. I don't know why I care about his opinion. It's Gnostic. It's really, in, in many ways, it's Gnosticism. Uh, pursuit of, of higher wisdom that guides this thinking. Higher knowledge that, that just... Oh my god! Pursuit of knowledge guides this thing. Pursuit of knowledge is so bad! Oh my god, guys. <laughs> you know what I hate more than these god Lamborghinis? Knowledge. Just a few people possess, right? Those, those who can get you woke to the right ideology to see your oppression. The only few possessed and must get the culture awake to. Freya? Really? Okay. I, I have to do it. I've been, I've been locked into it by channel point, gunpoint. Freya T with the 5,001 channel point, or 50,001 channel points. Thank you very much for redeeming those, even though I kind of hate every minute of this. You have redeemed them. For an oh well. Oh well. I want to die now. Can the bombs drop now? Please. 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 Okay, I'm not able to die, apparently. So I guess I'm just going to have to keep on suffering. So scriptural truth is therefore an offense to this kind of reality. Yeah, it is an offense very much to this oh, ideology because it oh, affirms oh. an opposing view of morality, law, man, his position under God, all of which is unchanging. And we can see that this ideology is obviously changing. Okay. So the word to this ideology is a tool to keep oppressed in their position and away from their so-called woke enlightenment. So brothers and sisters of Psalm 119, 160 says, The sum of your word is truth. Speaking of God's truth, by which we base everything in life, faith, and practice. And it says in that same verse, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. What confidence for the Christian that we're not thrown around by the waves of our culture, constantly trying to assess 
some of these ideologies. We have one truth that we stand on. It's infallible and it's unchanging. It comes from God himself. We can stand on that authority and assess. All right. So um, I got a question. When I have a daughter and, and you know, it, let's say, right, you know, let's say content warning. First of all, thank you very much, Felicia Angel, for the arara. Monster, uh, but let's say for the for for the, for the sake of argument, all right, that I end up having a daughter. Now, now, what would you say is uh, the right type of currency? Uh, how, how much of a said currency should I give to her rapist uh, as a dowry so that they can get married? How much? I mean, it's your book is the unchanging authority of God. So, how many shekels of silver do I owe? Your book tells me. Please, let me know. Spoiler alert, it's 50 shekels of silver. But go ahead. I, I just, I just, I just want to know what you think the proper thing to do if your daughter is not married and is sexually assaulted. Uh, what, what, what should be done there? Just, just... I mean, let me know. I just, you know, what do we do with a child who's rebellious? I, mm, something weird. What do we do to Canaanite children? Ah, uh, God, these are all really weird questions. Um, what should slaves do if they are enslaved and have very cruel masters? Jesus specifically talked about this one. Um, what should he do? Should he should he go like? escape? Should he go find a better life? Is slavery wrong? I, you, you have the perfect unchanging truth. It doesn't fucking change. Please, tell me. What does your book say about reality right now? Go ahead. Answer those questions with your book. Specifically. Let me know what you find. I'm sure it'll be interesting. This Satanistic tool against Christian doctrine Last point, brothers and sisters, it is anti-solution. It offers no hope. Where it seems to offer utopia and equality, it offers none. I would argue it absolutely removes the possibility of that whatsoever. Man gets himself where he is, right? And he must get himself out of his predicament. Marx was the one, ironically, that said history repeats itself. Don't think that it's not gonna happen again. That's his words. It tells us we are not exactly competent in fixing humanity's problems. Yeah, you can still have hope though. Like seriously, I did a whole video about this, the long defeat. You, you can you can still have hope here. You do not have to think that, oh, everything is going to be perfect one day for you to still have hope. There are still individual victories that you can hold solace in. By Marx's own profession. And so the solution of communistic revolution is left in the hands of the very people who can hardly figure out the fact that they are even oppressed. Right? And yet yeah. they're supposed to create a utopian society without... Any witness, nonetheless, to what is right or wrong. It's in the eyes of each individual person. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with humanity having to constantly go through this kind of struggle. It's, it's, it's okay to work towards a better tomorrow, even if that better tomorrow cannot come. It's fine. If you truly think that the world is so bad and cannot be changed in any functional way, shape, or form, then that is your problem. There are those of us that recognize that we might not be able to accomplish everything we ever want, but we will still try to do what we can. Just like it is worth it to save someone's life, despite the fact that they will eventually die. You cannot stop that death. But there's nothing wrong with stopping their death right now. You cannot stop misogyny from being a thing, ultimately, but it doesn't mean you can't stop different individual manifestations of misogyny right now. How he got where he is and what the solution might be. And you know what? If and, and yeah, I think you're right, Sienis. This is just him mad. This is just him saying he wants to be comfortable and Marxism makes him uncomfy. He's mad that he can't be comfortable. If he doesn't succeed, that's it. They don't stimulate communistic revolution, you're dead. It's over, right? What is material is it, and so it's over. And identity is misplaced, right? Purpose is actually removed. And even, I would argue, the purpose of work, which is really interesting. 
right? Identity is not placed in its rightful purpose as an image bearer and therefore a worshiper of God. But identity is, of course, placed in work in itself. But the biblical argument is that, well, you remove... Snickerbits, thank you very much for the follow. Um, okay, so... You say that the right place for people to be, the right, the right thing to be, is an image bearer of God. I, I, I just simply disagree. I just simply disagree. I think that the right place for people, as we are at our very core, individuals is wherever we individually want to be. If I want to be a YouTuber, that's my right place to be. If I want to be a professional card game player, that is my right place to be. If I want to be a McDonald's worker, that is my right place to be. Work in a sense by, by saying, well, man no longer has to work to, to feed himself. You need to remove a lot of man's initiative for work. Do you not see that today? Right? In a welfare society, remove man's purpose to work. We're supposed to work and have a sweat on our brow, but he would remove that. That's why we see so many suicides today. You take away the initiative. Wait, 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 what? You think giving people the ability to choose whether or not they are forced to be employed is causing more suicides? Where the fuck is that coming from? What the fuck? Initiative for work and say, well, now he has purpose. Now he has freedom, but you've actually enslaved him. No, you have So even if revolution occurred, man is left with one leader who has more power than ever before to become the ultimate oppressor. You just shift categories. Really, you can't avoid, in this ideology, you can't avoid class distinctions. It's always going to happen. If you take that man down from his oppressive stance, ultimately, you are now the oppressor. Okay, yeah, and that was one of the criticisms that Kropotkin had. Okay? The problem with people who, the problem with being obsessed with seizing the means of production specifically without having functional ways to do it if you want to seize it via violence is you just become the people who own the means of production then there's no guarantee that the people who seize it are going to redistribute it properly this is one of the reasons why it is it is best to, in my eyes this is why i am a socialist i want workers to own the means of production and i would prefer that to happen democratically i would prefer that to happen via you know uh, very aggressive usage of unions and and, and 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 trade areas and guilds and shit like that that's what i would prefer that's what i would want i'm not in for this fucking pro violence garbage unless you are doing it in self defense quality cannot be accomplished we will touch on that in future classes but man's alienation fails to consider any focus on what is actually inalienable and any damage caused to his rights. Isn't that interesting? Greatest alienation is because he has to work and pay the bills. And in a utopian society, you remove what is inherent to us as humans, our inalienable rights. And if no, you don't. You, you, you. If a right to healthcare is an inalienable right, but in a capitalistic society it is always generated for profit, then the uh, healthcare is not an inalienable right, but a commodity. If food is an inalienable right, and food is commodified, then food is something that you are always having to purchase with wages, and therefore not a human right. Your rights have actually been violated in Never these cases. Ellie the Twitcher, thank you very much for the follow. But yeah, no, this is your your rights. Your rights are not being violated if things are being given. By this logic, if your parents have given you an allowance, or have given you food, or have even given you so much as a room to live in, you are being oppressed. And that is the most emo, early 2000s, edgelord, 13-year-old on 4chan shit I've ever heard fundamentally misses that communistic revolution ends up removing rights and freedoms that are inalienable rather than granting freedom. And so for Marx, in seeking after what he thought gave us humanity, he actually removes it, right? What is fundamental to us. So by way of finishing John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want a solution to humanity's problems. You want a solution. You want, you want a purpose for life. You want a truth. You want an objective truth. You go no farther than the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did he say about slavery? Or is that a plus in your book? I think we're done. I think we're done. Look, if you're a Christian, Christ is fine to look to if you are looking to get into heaven when you die. Or if you are looking for somebody who is individually more moral than most other characters. Fine. But to say that he's a one-size-fits-all solution to everything is functionally to say he's a solution to nothing. If an answer works in position of everything, then it really answers nothing. 
Oy, 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 oy. Alan Twitcher, thank you very much. You said you're from Mexico. Your name is Alejandro, and today is your birthday. 20 awesome. Happy birthday, Alejandro. Hopefully, you're having a wonderful one. I am tired. Very tired. <sighs> I think I'm going to have to split this video up into two parts. This is an hour and four minutes long. What the hell? Jesus. Oh no, it's not. I'm not physically tired. I'm emotionally tired, Mega Chocomaniac. I. My brain is fried. It was not the condensed bullshit of a Prager U video, but. Still. It's good to get back to atheistic content, right? And then it's. Politics again. Oops, all politics. That's what it is. Anyway, with that said, if you enjoyed any part of this analysis, conversation, or what have you, please consider subscribing over on YouTube, hitting the like button, and hitting the subscribe button, the, the, the bell notification icon. That one. That one. <sighs> Anyways, everybody. Anywho. If you want to support the channel and what I do, you know how to do so. And as always, everyone, insert into the video tagline here. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. It really means a lot to me. If you want access to behind the scenes content for the channel, please consider checking out my Patreon. I do weekly vlogs over there where I give uh, real life updates to what's going on behind the scenes on the channel, stuff that you don't really get uh, over here and, and even on Twitch. Uh, Patreon also helps the channel's stability a whole lot. Without Patreon, I wouldn't be able to do this at all. Especially with the kind of content that I do, neither YouTube nor Twitch are the most stable sources of income. If you are a $20 and up patron, then you will be featured on the ending slides as shown in the beginning of the end credits. If you want to catch the streams where all this content comes from, then consider heading over to Twitch and following. And if you want to continue watching over here on YouTube, maybe consider clicking one of the end screen videos. And once again, I want to thank you so much for spending your time with me over on my channel. I wouldn't be able to do literally anything that I'm doing over here on YouTube without each and every one of you. So thank you.